Good morning, Pastor Sean here. Today is Thursday, September 7th, and this is your morning prayer. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, getting towards the end here of Isaiah. Uh, we have chapters 59 through 63 today. And um, I, I would probably, well, I'm going to focus most of my discussion here on chapter 59, because uh, I think it's very interesting. But um, just to, to kind of go through and, and summarize the uh, other chapters here, we've got uh, chapter 60, um, which is some great good stuff. Uh, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Um, a lot of uh, looking forward to the uh, future glory of Israel. Um, so this is a, a great, you know, imagine the context that this is being given in, that, you know, Israel has already been overrun and exiled. Uh, the people of Judah, is Isaiah has, you know, spoken woes to them and, and, and oracles of judgment, of the coming judgment, and, and that there is a time where they themselves will be taken into exile. So um, not, not a great thing to look forward to, but, um, you know, there is some comfort here where Isaiah does talk about the future glory, that, that the people of God will, that, you know, through a remnant will be preserved and a Messiah will come and God will save his people. So there, there is definitely hope and something to look forward to there. Uh, chapter 61 should sound very familiar. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Um, this is what Jesus reads uh, when he uh, preaches in the synagogue uh, in, in Luke chapter 4, after he goes and is tempted in the wilderness, and he comes back and um, he's preaching in the synagogues. And on one Sabbath, he stands up and reads from the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads this text. And what's remarkable is that he says, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Um, that, uh, you know, this is the day that the Lord proclaims that, you know, the captives are set free. The, the, all this wonderful stuff is happening. And it is happening in Jesus Christ, fulfilled not only um, in that day, but in, in him, in Jesus. Uh, continues in, in chapter 62 about uh, Zion's salvation, that it's coming, that uh, God will do this. So um, the, the salvation of Zion is coming. But then 63, chapter 63, there's also coming the day of the Lord's vengeance. So, um, you know, while, while there is the day of, of victory and, and peace and joy, there's also the day of vengeance. And uh, it's, it's kind of fun because it starts talking about the, the day of vengeance, but then shifts and says, you know, even, even in the midst of all this, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, which, you know, if you're just kind of coming in and, and pulling this out of context, it sounds very weird where God is talking about, oh, the day of vengeance, and I will come and I will, you know, I will press down and crush those who, the evil and the wicked. Um, and then, oh, but I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord. You, you, you'd put those two together and say, well, how can that, that be? Um, but you have to see how it's all fitting together in the context of, of God saying, my vengeance falls upon those who have not believed in me. For those who have not just not believed, but have fully rejected me, turned their backs from me. Uh, so on them, my vengeance comes. But on those who believe in me, who know me, who, who have heeded my word, um, then they understand and, and, and see clearly the steadfast love of God. Um, so drawing that distinction between unbelief and belief, faith, no faith. And then it closes with a prayer for mercy. So that's kind of what we got going on 60 through 63 there. But really what I would do is um, I like chapter 59 because it really um, explains kind of the situation we find ourselves in, in this world, in this broken, sin-filled world. And uh, see, as, as part of, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really do a lot on, on social media, but I do, um, I do pay attention to it to some degree. Um, not really engaging with it because um, I don't find that there's a lot of fruitful engagement going on there. It's mostly people just yelling at each other and talking past one another. Um, but what I what I do try, try to pay attention to and what I see um, trends in are, are people who um, 
were were raised Christian, um, often in evangelical circles or very kind of legalistic Christian um, uh, communities. And as they've grown up, they they've they've rejected it. They've turned away from it. And so, and a lot of um, kind of, if you want to call them atheist ap- apologetics about you know well how trying trying to answer questions like, well, how can, you know, you say God is loving. Well, how can he be loving if da, 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 da. And you say God is all powerful. How can he be all powerful if evil and, and all this other stuff? And so there's a lot of um, trying to reconcile, well, not trying to reconcile, but trying to show that there's a, a severe contradiction between what a Christian would say about God being loving and just and, and, and caring versus what we see in the world and, and what they hear as like, oh, God is saying, believe in me or else. Like, you either believe in me or I'm going to condemn you straight to hell. And uh, chapter 59, I think, um, really handles a lot of these questions or arguments uh, really well. Because it begins by talking about how, you know, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. Um so he's saying it's, it's not like, you know, God is unable to save you and it's not like God is unable to hear you. Okay. Even though maybe it feels like it sometimes, that's not the case. But in verse two, he says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So really what, what it does right from the get go is to put, you know, here's God who hears, who is mighty to save. Yes, but it's our sin that have caused that separation with him, you know, is because our sins that his face is hidden from us. Our sins are the reason why, why he does not hear because our sins have blocked that blocked us off from him. Um, and then it, it starts talking about just the situation, you know, our hands are defiled with blood fingers with iniquity. You know, um, our lips have spoken lies. No one enters suit, uh, you know, and no one engages in, in uh, legal matters justly. You know, no one goes to law honestly. We're, we're trying to get one up on one another all the time. Um, they speak lies, uh, speak lies rather. Um, their works are works of iniquity and deeds of violence are in their hands. Uh, their feet run to evil and they are swift to shed innocent blood. So, I mean, it's just describing like this is this is what we are. OK, let, before even getting to God, this is what we are. Um, and it really, you know, it gets down to verse nine. Therefore, um Justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind, we grope like those who have no eyes. So, like, we, we want light, we want salvation, we want all the goodness and love that, that God shows himself in Scripture, but we don't get it because we are sinners, because that sin blocks us off from all of that. So it's like... We're, we're separated from God because of what, what we've done and, and what we continue to do. And then we complain because we're like, oh, but I want peace and I want love and I want righteousness. And, and so then we project that onto God and say, well, you're, you must be keeping it from us. You're the one who says, well, I have to do this or else. And that's you're the reason why we have all this stuff, why everything's going to hell in a handbasket. When it's just describing everything that we do, <laughs> we are the reason behind all this. Um and then in verse 14 uh, is really kind of the, the kicker. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. That in our public square, truth has stumbled. Righteousness can't even enter. And then verse 15, truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Which just confounds the issue for us because, you know, as, as truth is lacking, so, you know, we, we ourselves can't agree on truth and it's all relative for us anyway, right? Nobody has truth and blah, blah, blah. And so then because that we, we have departed from truth and truth can't even take hold, um, we can't even depart from evil because it says, he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. So we find ourselves forced to, um, because of our own sinfulness, to embrace evil and embrace lies because if we don't, we make ourselves prey. We make ourselves vulnerable to others to prey upon us. Um, so it's like this vicious cycle that just keeps us um, in this this pit of sin and death. And, and it's, it's us. It's all on us. Um, and then it, verse 15b says, The Lord saw it, and it displeased him. 
you know, that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one to intercede. And then we get verse 16, then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. So, um, and we get into this where it says like the, the Lord looked down and saw this and saw how terrible the situation was for us that we have created for ourselves. How, you know, he, he did not condemn us. We've condemned ourselves. He does not send us to hell. We are marching right off to our own beat saying like, yep, I'm going right there. And without even realizing, even and the entire way we're, we're headed there, we're saying, but I want peace. I want happiness. I want life. Meanwhile, we're just trudging along our own little way. Um, and then the rest of Isaiah 59 talks about how, um, you know, uh, God will, will save. He will be the one to bring salvation. Um, in verse 20, a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. Um, so it ends by saying, and this is what will happen. God will save. You know, for those who remember God <laughs> and remember that he is the one who makes a covenant with them um, to say that my spirit is upon you, my words I put in your mouth, they will not depart from you, but to your children and your children's children, that he has promised salvation to those who turn to him. Um, that is the one who saves. So yeah, 59 is great stuff and I think really um, deals with a lot of those questions, arguments, whatever you want to call them, that um, are really kind of you see popping up a lot of places um, that would uh, would uh, denigrate God and what he's done and who he is. So, so there you go. That would be my, my suggestion for you today. So enjoy. <laughs> Let us pray. I thank you, my heavenly father, through Jesus Christ, your dear son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Blessings to you on this Thursday. Hope you have a great day today and uh, see you tomorrow. So until then, peace be with you.